Another massive day in US politics. Of course, we had that bombshell announcement over the weekend that Joe Biden's not going to run for re-election. Instead, he has endorsed his vice president, Kamala Harris. We've finally heard from the president himself. You know, in recent weeks, it's become clear to me that I need to unite my party in this critical endeavor. I believe my record as president, my leadership in the world, my vision for America's future all merited a second term, but nothing, nothing can come in the way of saving our democracy. That includes personal ambition. So I've decided the best way forward is to pass the torch to a new generation. Yeah, to be frank, look, the president looked pretty feeble. I think Paul Murray said on Sky earlier today that you held your breath. Uh, wondering whether he was going to actually finish the sentence. Now, I know he's recovering from COVID, but given we've still got six months until a new president is sworn in, it really raises serious questions about whether Joe Biden can continue in that role. Let's go to Washington. Our correspondent, Annalise Nielsen, has been across this all day. Let's start, Annalise, with perhaps the substance of his address. A lot of talk about democracy being at stake, reiterating his support for Kamala Harris. I think... What he was doing is almost talking in code and saying, well, you've now got the choice. You've got Kamala Harris and you've got Donald Trump, and Donald Trump's a risk to democracy. And look, when we look at what's happened over the last few days, too, this was such a lockup for Kamala Harris. No one else had any kind of breathing room to say, maybe I'll go in. And that's because they didn't do these primaries in the normal process. This could have been happening from last year. They could have let the rank and file members of the Democratic Party cast their ballots and decide who they wanted to be their candidate. But they were left with either Joe Biden, whose mental acuity issues were becoming so obvious to normal people after the debate, especially, that it just became an untenable position. And Kamala Harris had a lock on some major fundraising. And even beyond that, the closer we get to Election Day, the harder it is for anyone else to throw their hat in the ring. And when you have a crowded field of uh, hopefuls for Democratic leadership in the future, people who are popular in their own states as governors or successful senators, why would you risk it now to throw your hat in 100 days out from a presidential election against a guy like Donald Trump, who's come back from multiple lawsuits, being thrown out? Uh, an assassination attempt now and then try and take him on. Why not wait another four years, eight years for your time? So Kamala Harris just cornered the market, basically. Yeah, you, you wonder how Americans watching what they made of that last night. I mean, Joe Biden used terms like younger, fresher, passing the torch. I mean, wouldn't you be sitting in your lounge room in whatever state you're in in America and thinking, well, why didn't you do that? six months, as you said, or a year ago, and we all knew that you were not going to make it because you can't get up the stairs of a plane and you can barely finish a sentence. I mean, Americans would be feeling a bit jilted, wouldn't they, that this bloke stuck around for so long and then all of a sudden gets COVID and last weekend decides to bail. Well, look, most people don't follow politics as much as you or I or our viewers. Uh, what I've heard from a lot of people is that they're just relieved. They, they really thought they were just stuck with uh, Joe Biden. And I don't think the polls were wrong. I, I hear this a lot from people saying, oh, I don't trust polls anymore. And polls are a very different game in America because the market's bigger. There are more polls. They're done more comprehensively just because there's more money behind everything. So you do get a good read out of these polls and you can compare them to what's happening out uh, in the day diaspora of America, of which we do here at Sky all the time. And people were just becoming so apathetic and frustrated. And that's how you lose elections in America. It's not that uh, people have to pick one or the other. They can pick to not vote at all. And that's how you're going to lose states like Michigan and uh, Wisconsin and those really key states. And then apparently the last polling that Joe Biden was seeing, he was going to lose Virginia and New Mexico as well, which means 100 days out, if you're that bad, you're heading for landslide. And I don't, I, we, there's been this real nice honeymoon period for Kamala. Harris, um, I think just because people are so relieved, it'll be interesting to see whether that sticks because the, a lot can happen in 100 days. She's going to be out campaigning. There's going to be debates. Uh, Donald Trump's already said he wants more debates and it won't take much to kill that enthusiasm again. And then all of a sudden, uh, Donald Trump's back in the front seat. 
You go back to the Republican convention post the assassination attempt, and you and I talked about this, where Donald Trump slightly changed his demeanour. He was uh, more bringing the people together. He was, he was less bombastic, if you like. Is he going to go back to the old Donald Trump in a bid to take down Kamala Harris, or is he going to stick to the way he was in the days after that shooting? Look, so the two things I would say about that is I think we've seen a new Donald Trump who's a more polished politician from not necessarily the convention, but the debate. The fact that he had the uh, foresight and the discipline to step back and just let Joe Biden talk. That was really critical, and it was the thing that was an absolute turning point in this election. But then also the unity point. I thought that was so interesting that Joe Biden said that, to bring unity back to his party. The only thing the party wasn't united about was Joe Biden's age. And the only other thing really uh, kind of tearing it apart is this, uh, this split approach to Gaza. And, I mean, we've seen that with the protesters today. They were out setting the U.S. flag on fire and scrawling F. Biden on, uh, in graffiti around here. These are the people that are supposed to be voting Democrat, would be uh, boycotting or just uh, not voting for the Democrats altogether. And so I, I, I thought that was really interesting after the Republican Party. Yes, there's people out in the cold. We didn't see Mike Pence there. We didn't see um, other prominent leaders of the Republican Party. We didn't have George uh, Bush there either. But that entire RNC was so united behind Donald Trump. It was such a big celebration. They literally had every delegate vote for Donald Trump as their candidate because Nikki Haley uh, released her delegates and uh, all the former major competitors from the, uh, the, prim the primaries and the caucuses endorsed Trump. So that's a tough show of unity to come up against. I think, I think Joe Biden thinks that he can fix that now. But it's a lot to try and get done in 100 days. And it will be interesting to see if Kamala can get a solid VP candidate. I think that'll be a good indicator of how much people really think her campaign has legs. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu addressed Congress today. Annalise, uh, it was probably uh, what you noticed was how many of the Democrats were not actually there. I mean, 50 members of Congress walked out, including people like Pelosi, Elizabeth Warren, uh, the pollster Frank Lutz has said that more than 50 Democrats walk out, it will impact on the election. Is the Gaza conflict and, and where the Democrats and the Republicans stand on this going to be an election issue or is it really going to be an election about cost of living, border control? I mean, the thing to remember about America is it's always about the Electoral College map. And so you have to look at which voters in which states matter. And then when we're talking about uh, Israel-Gaza, they're bleeding support in Michigan and uh, they could lose a lot of support in Georgia around the blue areas as well. So this is where they're really going to feel the pain. And so it is a divisive problem. And the fact you had so many people, remember in the US too, every member of the House of Representatives goes to an election every two years. And so they're feeling this pain uh, from the ballot box more than anyone. But I noticed even being out today watching the, uh, this protest, it was uh, it reminiscent to me of the BLM protests in 2020, the, the kind of um, destruction that we saw, the lighting fires and the effigies, uh, the fencing that had to go up. I saw the tear gas and uh, protesters grabbing at police, uh, so assaults. Um, and it, it's a lot of the same atmosphere and I think that's going to ignite as the summer goes on. It's very hot here. It's very lengthy. We're going to have a, the convention in Chicago. I think we're going to see a lot more of those kind of protesters come out. And uh, that's going to really frustrate a lot of people as well because, the, I mean, they hit small businesses. Like, I tried to go buy dinner afterwards and all the restaurants around were closed. And those are all small business operators just trying to make ends meet. That has flow-on effects beyond the actual foreign policy crisis, how it plays out domestically is going to really change how people feel about it.